coaches like the big guards, big guards. I understood early on in my career that I had to play the game a certain way. And the way I impact the game was phenomenal in a way where they couldn't really truly grasp that, man, this little kid, this small young man out here really impacting the game to the point to where he doesn't even have to score a point to where they up stay winning by 20. It was something that nobody else has ever done. This is Muggsy Bowes. He's a former NBA player who played 14 seasons in four different cities, including my hometown with the Toronto Raptors. And at five foot three, he was the shortest man to have played in NBA history. Now, what makes Muggsy so remarkable is he's not only tenacious, he's not only hardworking, he's not only driven, he was able to turn his quote-unquote weakness of being the short man into a superpower. For me, you know, it wasn't an adverse atmosphere. It was more of a comfortable atmosphere for me because it was something I've been part of and something I believe that I should be part of my whole career because the mindset I always have, you play against the best, you have success against the best, now you must be included with the best. At five foot three, of course, the thing that everybody wants to talk about for your entire career, you're probably tired about it, is your height. I don't want to talk about your height. Here's what I do want to talk about. You have been able to make a career of turning weaknesses into ridiculous strengths against all the doubters, against all the haters, against everyone who says this man should not be in the NBA. <laughs> How have you lived your life turning weaknesses into strengths? Well, it starts with believing in yourself. Uh, having that confidence within allows you to go out there and do the inevitable. And uh, the things that I'd always carry in my mind is that, you know, anything that you believe, regardless of if you feel like you're ordinary, that you can become extraordinary. And that's the uh, mindset that I always, you know, try to provide in regards to what I and get myself involved in. And uh, if it's the game of basketball or something, you're just trying to beat life. And uh, so, you know, that's where it all starts within. It's cool to say, like, you got to believe in yourself. And, and I totally understand that. But there's like, believe in yourself. And then there's like, no one else has ever done this before. Everybody is going to tell you it can't happen. Like, how do you not allow that to seep in and erode that confidence? Well, that's where you got to have that strong skin, that strong mindset. And I think my upbringing allowed, helped me to be able to have them naysayers and have the folks that didn't believe in what I've won in life in one ear out the other and I knew early on at an early age that they didn't have an impact or in control of my life and thankful that I had that understanding um, because it could have been effective in terms of my growth and my pursuit and trying to the dreams that I was you know carrying around in my head if I would allow those individuals to take over that in my mind then I wouldn't be here talking to you today so <laughs> that's why I go back to it comes within you got to have that, that mindset that confidence because those folks always will tell you who you should be or who you need to be as opposed to you should know who you want to be. And when you have that understanding of yourself and of the, the things that you're, in, you know, you're trying to endure, especially the craft that I was trying to enter into that industry, trying to break down those barriers because all coaches like the big guards, big guards, and how I had to impact the game. And it had to be a little different than what little or smaller players normally do in the game. And that position called for leadership, understanding how to make guys around you better, being an extension of the coach, being effective on both ends of the, or the floor, and being a disruptive on defense allowed me to as well to not be looked upon and be taken advantage of my size because the information that I had and I have obtained in my head in terms of how to play against bigger players allowed me to, you know, to climb the highest ladder, which was the NBA. I know that you picked up basketball on the streets playing in, uh, in Baltimore. And then um, in high school, you know, you had some really big, really big breakthroughs. Was there a moment where, you know, a coach or or even in a game where you realized I cannot win by playing the way that everyone else wants to play? I can't count on what every other player counts on. I need to go at this looking at it differently, different attack, different, like, I got to use my skill sets. I can't play the game the way everyone else wants to. Yes, and I realized, I recognize that. And I'm thankful that I had a, a mentor, Mr. Leon Howell, who point those type of details out to me early on in my career because I knew I was going to be a small guard. My mom was only 4'11". My dad was 5'7". My brother was 5'6". And my sister was 5'1". So we was in that 5'0 family, and I knew I wasn't going to get much out of that 5'0 range. So I understood early on in my career that I had to play the game a certain way. I had a small guards in my neighborhood who played the game differently, but I had one particular 
who played it uh, almost similar to me, but again, slightly a little different. He was more score uh, mentality as opposed to me was pass first type of uh, mentality. But watching his style of play, how to play defense, how to steal the basketball, how to be that disrupted on the defensive end, it gave me that really belief that, hey, I can take this thing to a whole new level. I can be that 2.0 of what he's doing and having that understanding how to be really putting pressure on my opponent, how to make my guys around me better, how to really understand how to keep being that extension of the coach and having that understanding allowed me to really navigate through all those barriers that I had to break down. So cool though, because it's like, I mean, most, Again, I'm going to go back to most people. I got to just imagine, though, like, you know, being in a family of people all in the five foot range, you know, where where especially when you were growing up, you know, basketball players were just getting taller and taller and taller. Right. And then at the same time, looking for uh, looking for something that you love and something that you're passionate about. But it's just you're just so different than everyone else. And yet when you when you find your edge, when you find what makes you different and you lean into it, it's almost like it actually removes a lot of competition because you're not trying to go about it the same way. It's almost like I am going to make this happen or I'm going to die trying <laughs> because you're like you're going all in on the thing that either will make you totally unique or it'll be the one thing where there's like no recovery from it because you've gone all in on just like speed and being small and and it's out of your control do you know what i mean yeah but they've seen it all they've seen small guards so having an impact it's all about having an impact on the court and coaches see the impact that a player he could be big or small how he impact the game and the way i impact the game was phenomenal in a way where they couldn't really truly grasp that, and this little kid, this small young man out here really impacting the game to the point to where he doesn't even have to score a point to where they upstate winning by 20. So how is that to be where he don't have to score or and they winning by 20? It's all because he controlled the game. He, he controlled the tempo of the game. He it orchestrated in terms of, like I say, being the extension of the coach how to be able to run a team. And some some games, you know, caused that, created that. And, but, of course, most of the games that I did, you have to score to keep them off balance. And that's the knowledge of a point guard, having the understanding of the game. And that's where the great coaches, they see that and they say, well, Dag, it's, he's doing it on both ends of the floor. You know, he's doing it even as a small guard, but he having the same impact as it was if it was a six foot, you know, guard running our program. Did this uh, leadership role come naturally to you or was it something that you really had to like work on? And I think I was born a leader in that regard. I've always been someone that's outspoken. And I think, coming with the position that I had to play, again, gave me that platform to continue to use your voice because, again, I say, you, I was the extension of the coach. I had the ball in my hand 80% of the time, and the guys had to really look at me as what, what we're into and what we're trying to run. So, And also how to make them better and the egos and, you know, how to talk to one, how to put one in a position to be successful as opposed to not putting this one in that same position. So understanding the skill set. So that was something that I always had a, a understanding of and been able to develop that skill set and been able to have the mindset and understanding that I can compete with anyone. Just a matter of me being able to have an opportunity and given those opportunities, I always took advantage. I love it. I love it. Now, I do know that you pissed a lot of people off as well, right? You know, like in terms of your gameplay, in terms of how, I mean, the NBA obviously is a super aggressive game that's really, really fast with a lot of egos and a lot of tempers and a lot of people who are like crazy competitive. And so if you're thinking back to, to some of the, the biggest lessons you learned pissing people off, <laughs> does one come to mind where you're like, really shouldn't have done that? I, I woke in the beast. <laughs> Well, no. Well, it's a lot of those uh, times, of course, with Michael Jordan and those guys. Michael Jordan doesn't say nice things about you always. Eh? <laughs> no, really not. You know, Gary Payton, as well as the guys that you played against, the Tim Hardaway. But those are the great things that you love because that's respect. And one thing about us guards and us players, you don't want that constant pressure all day long, bringing the ball off the court, having to ward somebody off, fight somebody to get across half court, then run your offense and so forth. But I became that guy because I understood what 
I brought to the table in terms of me and my strengths and what going to allow me to continue to be on the floor, to be recognized, to be a disruptor. You know, I had to be that type of player, even though it was a pest to them. Did you love that? Did it like feed your energy or were you like, oh man, okay, I got to go do my job? That's exactly what it was. It was my job in terms of me being able to continue to keep serving the organization that I was representing to be able to continue to be the player that I wanted to be. And I knew that that could be, you know, an advantage for me in that regards to be able to, you know, get in guys' head, to be able to disrupt them, take time off the clock, you get the ball across half court. And then once they do, you could cross half court, be able to maintain that aggressiveness and play them, you know, very hard and make them earn everything they got. I often think that here, here's an example, and, I, and I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that uh, you're, you're, as old as as my grandfather, but uh, my grandfather, uh, I was sitting down with him. He he's turning ninety four this week, and I was sitting down with him a few weeks ago and talking about when he was younger and when he first moved, you know, from Europe post World War, and he built up a big company and he took on all these risks. And I asked him like about ambition, because for some reason, it's hard for me as a younger person to imagine my grandfather as this young ambitious, hustling person. So I asked him, like, what was what motivated you to work so hard? What motivated you to do these things? And so I think sometimes when you're younger, it's hard to imagine that older people like had had the crazy ambition, was super competitive, had the ego, wanted to have sex, like all of that stuff that we just somehow think is only for young people. What was it within you that like drove this need and this desire to like, frankly, be so, so fucking good at this? It's the stages of, of life that you go through. As a kid, you know, you, you dream it to be whatever that you turn in your mind to be. And luckily it, that you find that gift that God has given all of us to where we can able work on that to where it could become a career. And being able to have that vision and to be able to have that understanding and uh, ambitions to, you know, to show these naysayers that God, no matter how big or tall, the game of basketball is for, all, for us all. And to be able to go out there and display that on a daily basis to really not short on just one level, but on each level that a player my size is capable of being successful regardless of his height. And having that understanding and that hunger of what I wanted. What drove that? Like money and fame and like, or was it like, let me prove to the world that I can do this? Of course, yeah. I mean, it was something that nobody else has ever done. You know, when I looked at the smallest guy that ever did it, he was six foot one at the time was Tony Archibald. Then, you you know, you look at Charlie Chris and those guys were 5'10", and Marty Tao Marty had a chance to, to make it as well. And Bob Cousy was six feet as well. So when you look at those players, you know, no one identified as five foot anything in that regard, the five foot three foot in any way. Um, so that was something that I wanted to be the first. And they even not really thinking about it at the time, subconsciously, that was something that you was driving towards but you know and as your grandfather you know as that stage as we go through in life that what we want something and as we you know so passionately want to go get it you know there's nothing that's going to prevail us from getting it um and that's that's the mindset and the confidence that we have in with stuff some could call it cockiness some could call it ego but we always related to confidence and being able to accomplish the goal that you set out for yourself is an amazing trait. And those are the things that you should be proud of in terms of, you know, but again, we never always satisfied because we always seem like we want more. Was there a little bit of like fronting or like, you know, fake it till you make it? Or were you able to like be as confident because of your training, because of your experience at each step? Because your career like really took off, right? Yeah, well, it was no sense of faking it till you make it in my regards. You know, it was all about trying to make it to get to that point to where folks really believe that a guy your size is legit. And that's respectful and gaining that respect. It always came from the peers. And when you had that, that's what made it more, you know, gratifying than the malls, because that's where it starts. And once you had that respect for those guys that you plan with, plan against, who you competing constantly. And those are the things that really matter the most. And then all the other stuff kind of falls into place when you start to be put on certain platforms and on the national stage and so forth. And then people get an opportunity to, to now see the skill set and then become inquisitive because that's what folks do. They become inquisitive, especially where they haven't seen anything that they haven't seen before. And a guy like myself that they never seen before. And that was always something that that inquisitive mind wanted to see and wanted to wonder 
how successful he can be in that diversity atmosphere that he's in. And for me, you know, it wasn't an adverse atmosphere. It was more of a comfortable atmosphere for me because it was something I've been part of and something I believe that I should be part of my whole career because the mindset I always have, you play against the best, you have success against the best. Now you must be included with the best. I love the coaching line, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. How do you not allow all of the side show that comes with fame to distract you? It all comes from your upbringing. All that was instilled in you at an early age and not getting too caught up in what that so-called status is. And for me, it was just a job. You know, it was no title, you know, celebrity with folks that label you. That's what they label you as. But as you, you know, it was you playing in front of a lot of folks and people just appreciate the things that you're doing. And uh, it's no different from when you're off the court. You know, you want to be treated how did you want to be treated, just like you want them to be treat you. So um, and our moms always had that humbling, you know, approach to where, you know, you always meet the same people. You're going to the top that you're going down. So you always stay humble in your growth and whoever you become. Um, so that was something that I always knew and always wanted to be. And I never took it for granted. Celebrity status is always about, you know, so for me, you know, it never got to me and it never became bigger than me. And I always stay grounded. And the people who know me always get that type of vibe when they come across and meet me. <laughs> you know, I, I obviously watched a lot of your footage and preparing for this conversation and you just seem like the real deal. And so either you're the most amazing actor in the world <laughs> or you really are just the real deal. Oh, uh, well, you know, hey, you know, real is re real, recognized real. And, um, you know, like you said, I'm just grateful and thankful for what I was able to do and to help the folks that helped me along the way because I never, I didn't do it by myself. And, you know, and I'm just so thankful for God, all that he's done for me and my family and the way he guided me, navigated me from a kid through the projects of Baltimore all the way to, you know, living down here in Charlotte at the age of 57. So and, and the folks that he blessed me with, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. And I mean, I'm just so grateful for friendships and all that he's done for me and looking forward to many, much more uh, moving forward. So if you had to. I don't like the idea of saying like, go give advice to a younger version of you. But, you know, for those of us who are in our, uh, you know, if we're teenagers or if we're in our 20s or even in our 30s today, the world is such an upside down place. And it's so hard to just make stuff happen these days. What advice do you have for us based off of everything you've done and learned? Well, the first, you know, with the world that we're in today, everybody's so divisive. And, you know, I just want to say, first, you got to start with respect. You know, respect one another, um, you know, have an opportunity to listen to each other because no one agree. You know, you can agree to disagree or disagree to agree at this level where you want to look at it. Um, but just be, you know, that, that word love is always t taken for granted. But if it's preached more, it will come across in behavior and things that we do and how we go about doing things and and how we treat, you know, the things that we, you know, want to accomplish as as a whole. You know, we are we all human beings uh, and everybody have a choice to live their life the way they decide to live it, whom they decide to live it with. And we just need to, you know, respect people in their boundaries and in their lanes and Hopefully that this world will be a better place um, because we all want the best for our, each other. I mean, for our kids. And I would think if you want the best for your kids, you will want the best for the next person, for your neighbor kids. And and having that attitude, you know, this world will be a much better place. You know, it will be less hate and a lot more love going around. Amazing. And, and Muggsy, for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? I'm just thankful. You know, I'm thankful. I come from... Where I've come from, I mean, hey, man, I am thankful more than you can ever know. And I thank him each and every day for what he's done for me. And again, as I say, who he's uh, surrounded me with. And I don't take it for granted because life is not promised at any stage in our life. Not no second, not a minute, not a day. So I will be thankful for each and every, you know, minute and second that take you know, tick off that clock. And I'm just thankful for my family and look at them and all everybody's healthy. And I don't take that for granted. At the end of the day, as long as I can put a smile on my face, as Jimmy Fondo said it the best, you know, if you can laugh and smile and cry one day, that's a heck of a day.